Stanley Kubrick, he worked on certain videos, movies, very controversial fella, maybe even the man that shot the landing on the moon, a filmmaker recreating the scene and uh, maybe doing a mass hoax on everybody. It was interesting theory that he had a part in that. He had this land. But we're still going on. Let's get to his last movie. He died on the final edit. The day he did it, it took him two years to make. It was eyes wide shut and it portrayed the secret society. And it was quite scary and uh, enlightening at the same time of what's possibly going on behind the scenes. Jim, do you think this is what some of our world leaders are participating in? These kind of extravagant, you know, uh, uh, Yes, I think, uh, I think that uh, eyes it, wide shut. Uh, was it, an attempt by Stanley Kubrick to try to tell us what's going on, and you have to understand that he died <clears throat> just about the time that was uh, was being completed in that uh, the studio uh, altered and, and edited a whole lot of that movie. That's why I know the first time I saw it, I thought, "Well, it's a pretty good flick," and I think they're really trying to tell us something here, but it's kind of disjointed, you know. And I think that they. Uh, edited it heavily to, uh, uh, to so that it uh, number one everybody could just say well it's just a movie, and number two it's like well what was he trying to say here you know, but uh, and I also uh, I have seen the European documentary uh, that where they interview uh, Richard Nixon's secretary and uh, Stanley Kubrick's widow and uh, in, including uh, uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, and and uh, Alexander Haig, and uh, they all were talking about how that Nixon had commissioned Stanley Kubrick because he already had the sets and the and the uh, spacesuits and everything needed to film uh, a moon landing uh, in the event that we went to the moon on Apollo 14, and then uh, or Apollo 11, I'm sorry, and then came back. And uh, the radiation in speed and space, particularly the Van Allen radiation belt, may have fogged the photographs and film. And he was concerned that the rest of the world would say, well, hey, you guys claim you went to the moon, but where are the films? Where are the photographs? So he had Kubrick uh, secretly uh, record this moon landing, okay? And I think that seems to be pretty much beyond uh, question. Now, the question is, what did we see? <laughs> did we see an actual moon landing, or did we see the Kubrick uh, footage? You know, a lot of people state that um, during the moon landings that we were scared off by extraterrestrials, or there was possibly these humongous, uh, you know, buildings and bases on the far side of the moon. What do you know about those? Well, I just almost uh, not much more than what you do. Uh, yes, I've heard the same rumors. But, uh, of course, uh, there's never been any official admission to that. But then all you have to do is just back off and look at the whole situation. <clears throat> we had 22 uh, rockets uh, ready to go, and we were told that once we got to the moon and, and we were going to continue to go, we were going to build a base on the moon, we are going to mine the minerals of the moon, and it would help pay for the U.S. space program. And yet we made... Uh, uh, six trips, I think, and then said, no, that's it, nothing there, folks, we're just not going to go back, and that was, you know, what, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, what happened to all of that, and and why did we have those rockets ready to go and then didn't use them? Um, it's it's kind of similar to going to the time and trouble and expense of building a Rolls Royce and then say, well, we're not going to drive it around because we can't afford the gasoline. <laughs> and they say, you know, it just costs too much. And none of that makes sense. And I think it actually kind of lends support to the idea that in some way we were warned off and told, hey, no, nah, don't come back. You know, it's Kennedy's idea to go to the moon. And I want to get back to the Zapruder film. What do you think it like, took so long, 14 years before that famous film came out publicly? Well, on the broadest possible sense, and, and just from a common sense and physics standpoint, uh, we were told, and the official word still is, that it was Oswald with three shots from the school book depository, which was 200 feet behind him and, and uh, 60 feet in the air, 
uh, would be coming in from behind him. And yet it's obvious to anyone who's seen this fruit of him that he's violently thrown to the uh, left and to the rear, which indicates a shot from the right front. And I think that's the reason why it was covered up. In fact, here's, here's proof that they knew this and that they tampered with it, is that Time Life, which got control of the Zapruder film, uh, published still frames from the Zapruder film, and yet at the frames that covered the uh, fatal headshot, they uh, said there was a uh, printing accident, and they transposed those frames so that you couldn't tell from the still frames that he was being thrown to the rear. Now, okay, maybe that was a printing accident, except, interestingly enough, the same accident occurred in the Warren Commission report. They also published still frames from the Zapruder film, and they also accidentally transposed <laughs> those, the headshot so that you couldn't see that he was thrown to the left and to the rear. Uh, to me, that is highly indicative of a major cover-up. And by the way... Uh, it's been held for so long that the Zapruder film was a, a timeline, photographic timeline of the assassination, and it's been long cited as, as one of the most important pieces of evidence in determining what actually happened to Kennedy. But in my new updated version of Crossfire, which is due out in uh, either late October or early November, you're going to find that there is an abundance of evidence now to show that the Zapruder film uh, – was in the hands of the CIA that very weekend and was uh, doctored before it was given to Time Life. And in fact, there uh, I cite 11 Hollywood film experts uh, who are expert in uh, all kinds of film, including eight millimeter, who say that uh, at the time of the headshot that there are uh, uh, frames of the Zabruder film that have been crudely painted on. So in other words, they doc you can't even trust the Zapruder film these days. Blake, I know you got some follow up questions. Go ahead. Thanks. It's quite interesting that it's been in the possession of the CIA doctor film. How are you gonna judge even the Zapruder film? I wanted to dispel the rumor uh on what you would think. Would you dispel the rumor people say that the driver may have done this shot or this famous image where it appears that yes. the driver what do you say yes. about that? absolutely yeah. I, yes yes that did not happen okay uh, yeah. again i published the pertinent frame uh in um, my new updated uh crossfire and it's obvious when you get a a clear version of that frame of the zapruder film that uh, Greer, the driver, William Greer, his hands are on the wheel. He does, turn, contrary to his uh, uh, testimony, where he said he never looked back, he didn't even know the assassination happened until Roy Kellerman next to him said, well, hit, get us out of here, and he stepped on the gas. But contrary to that, he did turn his head and look back over his right shoulder towards the president as the brakes were applied to the car, and it came to almost a dead stop until after the headshot was delivered, and then it accelerates on out of the plaza. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of questionable. But, no, his hands are on the steering wheel, and uh, what seems to be a gun and a flash are just artifacts of sunlight. Uh, back in those days, it was quite the custom for men to wear hair grease. You know, grease, now they don't call it grease anymore. It's, uh, I forget what they call it. They, they call it something else now. Uh, but it's still greasing your hair down, and they did, and this was sunlight reflecting off of Kellerman's head uh, and also sunlight glinting off of the um, steel. Uh, it's like a rollover bar, except it's not really a rollover bar. It's a, it's a frame, a, a metal frame uh, behind the two drivers that if when the top is up, they can raise a privacy uh, window and it goes up into that frame. And, uh, I think the window was down, but the frame was still there. And you see sunlight cleaning off of that, which to some people was a shot. But anyway, without going into long details, uh, the idea that the driver shot Kennedy is simply wrong. Who do you think did kill Kennedy or was a part of the conspiracy? Well, uh, w when you say who killed Kennedy, uh, you know, that's a multi-level uh, question. 
Uh, are you talking about who actually pulled the trigger? Are you talking about who passed the money? Are you talking about who gave the orders? Are you talking about who benefited? So uh, uh, as far as who actually fired the shot, uh, that's pretty much hoping to debate now since they've uh, covered that up for so many years and tried to blame it on Oswald. The only thing I'm fairly confident of is that Lee Harvey Oswald, I do not believe he even fired a shot that day. And if he did, he certainly didn't hit anybody. And the reason I say that is because here's two uh, items of fact that uh, tends to exonerate Oswald. One, as soon as he was taken to the police station, they uh, gave him a paraffin test where they put paraffin on his hands and on his face uh, to find out if there was any residual gunpowder or nitrates indicating he might have fired a weapon that day. Uh, it showed that he had faint traces of nitrates on his hands, but no gunpowder, and no gunpowder or nitrates on his face. Well, I can assure you, since I have one of those 6.5 man liquor loose bolt Italian war rifles, that the only way you're going to even come close to getting six shots out of it in, uh, I mean, three shots in six seconds, is to continue to hold it up next to your cheek, you know, the typical rifle firing position. And then you cannot, you don't have time to lower it, so you have to crank the bolt right there by your face. And I can assure you, if he had fired a rifle and then opened that bolt, the gases would have blown nitrates and gunpowder back on his face. But he had no traces of gunpowder on his hands or face, and only traces of nitrates on his hands, which he could have gotten from uh, uh, ink, okay? printing ink, which he would have gotten by handling those boxes of, of school textbooks there at the school book depository. The second piece of evidence is that if you look in Appendix 11 of the Warren Commission report, you'll find the report from Captain Will Fritz, who is the only in-depth interrogation of Oswald. And even then, reportedly, there was no tape recording made, no stenographer notes. All we have is what Fritz said in his report but right there he said he asked oswald where were you at the time of the shooting and oswald said he was in the downstairs lunchroom not the second floor lunchroom where he was found uh, less than a minute or so after the shooting holding a, a coca-cola in his hand or a soft drink but the downstairs lunchroom also known as the domino room and uh, he said okay he said was anybody in there with you and he said yeah there were these two uh, other employees uh, one of them's named Junior, and uh, the other is uh, kind of uh, tall and skinny. Well, Harold Norman is tall and skinny, and Junior Jarman uh, were indeed in that lunchroom eating their lunch uh, before moving up to the fifth floor to watch the motorcade. And, of course, uh, any good defense attorney would say, well, now, how could Oswald have correctly identified those guys being in there unless he had been there to see them for himself? And it's also true that they found Oswald's jacket and his clipboard in the downstairs domino lunchroom. So I think there's pretty good evidence that he was exactly where he said he was. I wanted to ask you about Jack Ruby, and how does he fit into all this, the conspiracy? Well, Jack Ruby was a uh, major player for organized crime in Dallas and uh, was also very well politically connected in Dallas. In fact, was uh, the guy behind a lot of high-stakes poker games in Dallas that included a lot of the wealthy oil men. Henry Wade, the district attorney, was even said to have gone to some of those parties. Uh, he was uh, pretty much uh, connected uh, to the Dallas high rollers, and uh, I think he was given marching orders by the mafia. He told some close friends that it wasn't even his idea to come to Dallas. He wanted to go to California. He wanted to go to Hollywood uh, like Johnny Roselli. But he said, I was told I had to go to Dallas. So, uh, in other words, he was a mafia pawn and had been ever since he was running messages for Al Capone back in Chicago as a young boy. Uh, so he's well connected. So when the mafia gives you a directive and order, uh, you just carry it out. And uh, the key to uh, really shooting of Oswald, uh, and by the way, I could, I could put about 15 witnesses on the stand uh, uh, back then, who would have testified that they knew that Oswald and Ruby uh, were together prior to the assassination. So Ruby was a player in the whole thing. And that's another thing, too, let me quickly add. 
I'm not saying Oswald was a total innocent off the street. Uh, he was involved in this plot, but uh, according to his ex-girlfriend, uh, he was a low-level U.S. agent who had started off working for the Office of Naval Intelligence and then been passed along to the CIA, and at the time of the assassination was being guided and manipulated by the CIA and the FBI because uh, information was developed that he was an FBI informant uh, with the code uh, T-179 and being paid a, a, a small sum uh, to be an informant for the FBI. So he was there, and I think he thought he was reporting back on the progress of the assassination plot, thinking that it would be stopped and never, never understanding that he was being set up to be the patsy. But when he got taken alive, then it was incumbent upon the conspirators to get rid of him. That's when they activated the mafia connection, and Ruby was told to go and silence him. Now, we were told at the time that, and we know this for a fact, that just a few minutes before the transfer of Oswald, Ruby was next door at the Western Union office sending a money gram to one of his uh, strippers. And uh, so they've argued that, see, um, he couldn't have known when they were going to move Oswald, and therefore it was just an accident that he stumbled down into the basement just at the time that Oswald came out. And he was so uh, angered at the, the thought of, and Mrs. Kennedy having to come back to Dallas and go through all of this, that he just stepped out and shot Oswald as a spontaneous act. And yet what we now know, and the House Committee verified, he had been stalking Oswald the whole weekend. And to understand the shooting, all you have to do is reverse the circumstances. It wasn't that he just suddenly showed up when they moved Oswald, which occurred an hour later than they said they were going to move him, but instead that they didn't move Oswald until Ruby was in position to shoot him. And Ruby dragged his feet because he didn't really want to do that. In fact, he told the reporters at the time of his trial, he said, I can't really talk to you. I'm supposed to be crazy. You know? <laughs> Blair, the signal is like... Question. Go ahead, Blake. Yeah, he also said there's a big plot going on right now. So he tried to tell. He tried to tell the Warren Commission. He said, my life's... It's not worth a plug nickel here in Dallas. Can you get me out of here and take me to Washington? If you do, he says, I think I can lay things out for you. And he says, and if you don't, I think we're going to see a whole new form of government, you know. And uh, the Warren commissioners, including Earl Warren, said, well, we can't really do that. And besides, it's lunchtime. So they left. Do you think and there's more video? Incredible. Do you think there's more film out there? Uh, Mr. Preston's on uh, online here. I want to get him on, but I just want to get this quick question. Do you think there's more film that the government still has that hasn't been released under the assassination of JFK? Oh, yes. Yes, I think the, the uh, Beverly Oliver's film, which was taken from the opposite side of the, of, uh, Mains, of the Elm Street and probably showed the scuba poster in the background, might have been uh, a really, really critical film. And yet she said that was taken by the FBI, and we've never seen that, and they deny they have anything like that. So I think actually somewhere buried in government files, if they hadn't been destroyed, that there are very, very uh, interesting uh, films and or photographs. And I also think that there may be some in the hands of private citizens. Uh, uh, it seems like just every few years uh, something crops up uh, because there were hundreds of people there in Dealey Plaza with both movie cameras and uh, still cameras taking pictures and um, I still think there's a chance that there's, there may be something out there that everybody's unaware of that might uh, suddenly turn up. Now the reason we haven't seen more is that uh, I had been living here at the time and in that area uh, the newspapers and the radio and the TV stations uh, in the wake of the assassination were just filled with appeals from the federal government for people who were in Dealey Plaza to turn in their films and their uh, and their uh, photographs, you know, for evidence purposes. And back then, everybody trusted the government. Everybody was very patriotic. And so they came and they turned over all their photographs and films to the FBI. And now they claim they don't even have any of these. Uh, and the only ones we know about are some of the more famous ones, like the Zapruder film and and uh, much more film, the Nix film, and a few others. Uh, you know, but I think there's a lot more that they had, had, or still have, uh, that have never seen the uh, light of the public. 
Mr. Mars, that's one thing I love about talking to you because you have so much information. But I want to inform you that we are joined by two new people. Preston Dennett, the original co-host, a member of the Third Phase Moon team, who I'm sure you know from years back. He's been a MUFON researcher of 26 years, author of 17 books. But before we bring him in real quick, we do have another caller. Area code 760. Welcome to Third Phase Moon Radio. Jim, uh, I'm a great fan of yours. I think you have a tremendous... Uh, perfectly lined up set of information going traveling backwards into history I think I think you have one of the best explanations and more or less proofs kind of of uh, of what really has been happening and how it all started so I'm a great fan and I wanted to say you have another fan in New York he's like it was kind of funny I met him in New York he was like an sort of a con artist gang member drug dealer but he loves you and and like you're part of the reason he actually was more or less reformed and then he actually escorted me through the city late at night to make sure i wasn't harmed by any of his like ex-friends and gang members and stuff like yeah, that how cool is that <laughs> <laughs> i know and the book dealer of the tables out on the sidewalks they loved you as well the particular owner of uh, one of them. So uh, I did actually buy a book, your book, that night, and that's how this all happened, um, which I never got to read, unfortunately, but I will. And uh, <laughs> hey, yeah, don't, but, uh, loan, don't loan it to your friends, and often it doesn't come back. <laughs> anyway, Bill, we'll come right back to you. Preston Dennett, I know you had a question, and I know Blake's on a roll with some follow-ups. So go ahead, Preston. We'll come right back to Blake. <laughs> Hi, Jim. It's great to speak with you. Howdy. Yeah, I have a, a million questions. Um, I'm a huge fan as well of your book. Oh, because uh, I only got 999 answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, your books are tremendous. Above Top Secret, Alien Agenda was actually my favorite, and I think it's one of the best fully rounded books about the whole UFO phenomenon. And it's one I recommend to everybody because you can't read that book and come away unconvinced that there's something to this phenomenon. Thank you. And, uh, what I, you know, like I said, I've got a lot of questions, but uh, um, I'm really interested in your uh, research into NASA. In one of the chapters of your book, An Alien Agenda, you called uh, NASA means never a straight answer, which always <laughs> makes me laugh. And I wonder if you could, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit about, you know, what you've uncovered with the NASA cover-up in UFOs. Yeah, well, NASA... Uh of course, uh, is a government agency, and as such, and also, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Also, a lot of people don't realize that NASA is basically military operation. Uh, in fact, most of those early astronauts were all military officers, so they're all under the code of military justice and under military uh, authority. And so, if they're ordered not to say something or to say something, then they simply have to do it. Because uh, disobeying, disobeying orders in the military could mean time in Leavenworth. So, uh, you know, and then there have been the whistleblowers for eight years out of NASA that says they had, some of them even said they personally had worked on doctoring photographs from the moon, doctoring photographs from space, um, editing out <laughs> pictures of UFOs. Uh, in fact, you know, there for a while, NASA who was sending live feeds back from the space station and then all of a sudden like uh, STS-48 and some of the other ones, uh, here's all of these shots of these uh, luminous objects flying all around the earth and going in and out of the atmosphere and it started hitting the internet and then all of a sudden NASA stopped uh, sending live feeds back from space. <laughs> too many people were seeing too many uh, <laughs> views of these UFOs and other stuff going on so yeah, NASA means never a straight answer. Right now, I'm really fascinated and interested in the whole idea of this uh, uh, tenth extra planet that may be coming into our solar system. Uh, the uh, uh, Sumerian tablets call it the twelfth planet because they counted the sun and the moon. Uh, it used to be in the 80s, there were actually mainstream news stories about a tenth planet, and that was back when they were calling Pluto a uh, planet and now it's, he's just been relegated to mickey mouse's dog <laughs> but uh, no it's called it a non-planet uh, go ahead blake well we spoke to the man sixth man on the moon third mission to the moon right here on third face of the moon uh edgar mitchell and he 
get seriously about NASA again. We asked Edgar if there was any protocol if he was to come across extraterrestrial life in his mission, and he said there, that there was none whatsoever. Do you think he's telling the truth? If you know our astronauts are going to extraterrestrial bodies like the moon, that they're not going to be uh, kind of trained if they were to come across an extraterrestrial life on how they would communicate with NASA over the radio waves, et cetera? Well, that's an interesting question, and uh, unfortunately, I'm just a reporter. I, I, uh, I, even though I was in the military, I wasn't privy to things like that, and uh, also uh, uh, I'm not privy to the internal workings of NASA. Uh, I'm kind of like you. I find it hard to believe that uh, these military officers that were the early astronauts uh, were not given some sort of instruction as to what to do if they encountered a uh, an alien uh, presence. However, on the same, on the other hand, I can also see that the whole position of the government, from day one almost, has been to deny that anything like that is happening. In fact, you know as well as I do that for so many years the policy was denial and ridicule. You didn't see anything, and if you keep saying you did, you might might need psychiatric help. And that certainly has proven very effective in keeping so many people quiet about their uh, UFO experiences. So it is entirely possible that uh, the military did not uh, give any specific instructions like that for the sheer reason that uh, to uh, give instructions like that would be to imply that they had reason to believe that there was such an extraterrestrial presence, and that was something they were loath to do. Well, the, with other things that Edgar was saying, he sometimes didn't want to answer the questions, and probably because of the clearance that he does have, and he's still uh, hanging through with his clearance, and we have to uh, respect that. That's right. right. So, as far as protocol now, do you think the astronauts, in a more of a 2020th century way of thinking, that they're going to be uh, prepared with protocol? I tried to ask NASA, get on the chat lines, get anywhere to ask NASA that direct question. What is the protocol to get the information if they did come across extraterrestrial life and get it to the public? And I've yet to get that answer. <laughs> and is it is a And you probably won't. <clears throat> yeah, I'd be real surprised at this late date if uh, the current astronauts are not given some something. Uh, <clears throat> it would probably be very noncommittal and along the lines of the JNAP regulations that were put into effect in the early 50s. You see, early on, air, uh, the airline pilots, uh, if they had a UFO experience, they would contact their airlines and make a report. Well, these reports were hitting the public. Uh, and in the early 50s, they were growing in number. Well, the government stepped in and enacted these regulations that said if you have uh, some unusual, unexplained, anomalous uh, experience, then you contact the government. And they would, uh, that was uh, early, some of the early uh, programs that they set up. Uh, and you call the government and reported to them, this, thus bypassing the airline. Uh, administrations which were leaky and might actually tell people what was going on and what developed pretty quick was that if you were an airline pilot and you did contact the government and tell them that you had had an experience then government agents would show up you'd, they'd take you out of work for several days on end missing that pay and then they would browbeat you and try to uh, hold you up to ridicule and uh, Call you all, all, do everything but call you a liar to your face, and pretty soon the pilots just, you know, got the point, which is don't contact the government, regardless of what you see, and that's how they've kept the lid on that end of it. And I suspect that there's something very similar going on with the current astronauts. Uh, plus, there's the overall thing that they just kind of intuitively know what their superiors want and what they don't want. And I think they realize they don't want reports on UFOs, so either they will come back and not make a new report, or they'll come back and make a uh, covert report that'll end up in some classified file somewhere uh, so that the public never sees it. There have been a lot of NASA astronauts that have actually seen stuff on missions, and some of it was actually recorded on the right. STS missions, and I just think that's mind-blowing. And also in the 80s, there was an article that appeared in the New York Times that said that the military canceled their military space program. So is it possible that NASA is just 
a cover-up, civilian cover-up, when the real stuff going on is in the military space program? Oh, I think that's absolutely the, the situation. That's exactly what it is. That's how they're able to keep the lid on everything. With respect to the military and uh, what they're doing, they've already released this photograph of uh, what looks to be a mini space shuttle. They said they stopped the space shuttle program. Well, no, they didn't. They modified it into something that looks pretty much kick-ass, and it's a lot better designed than the, uh, what NASA did, but it has Air Force on it, and when it says Air Force, well, obviously that's one of our military components, and they just released that amazing photo. I wanted to put that out there. Jim, did you get to see that uh, recent uh, imagery? Well, you uh, you know, of course, that the military is always 20 years or more ahead of the public with their technology. Uh, and, in fact, this is another reason I think that they finally shut down the space program is because uh, more and more people were becoming to understand that UFOs do not use ramjets, okay, and that these big old rockets that we've seen ever since the 40s, you know, billowing flame and smoke and rising up into the air, that is antique technology. Uh, today it is energy fields. Uh, and anti-gravity, okay? But that's his top secret stuff, and they don't talk about that. And so, yeah, uh, I, I think I know what you're talking about on the smaller craft, but the smaller craft, see, these things can actually now, using advanced technology, they can actually go on up into orbit and uh, into the upper atmosphere and then into orbit. And uh, But, of course, they don't want to make a big deal out about this because then people start saying, well, how do they do that? And then they'll have to reveal their anti-gravity uh, energy manipulation technology. I've been asking some of the experts in the in the ufology world, and basically I want to get this one to you. If somebody had an alien being in their possession, alive or dead, would it be a national security uh, issue? Would uh, that person be safe in this world? Would they be able to get this information out because no. they had it in their possession? No. <laughs> No, in fact, in fact, it, it, this is one of the great ironies of this whole subject is that on the one hand, the government has long maintained that there's no such thing, and yet on the other hand, there are federal laws against the possession of any alien artifact or being or anything, okay? So if you, ha if you come into the position, if, if Paul comes and visits you, uh, and uh, you contact the government and say, hey, I, uh, Paul the alien is here visiting with me, you're in for a world of trouble. Cause they're going to come down on you like a ton of bricks, and they're going to threaten you with lifelong imprisonment for violating these government laws against possessing an alien artifact. They're going to tell you it's national security. They're going to take Paul away, and you're going to keep your mouth shut. So if you do happen to get uh, friendly with an alien or you have one in your possession, for God's sakes, don't tell the government. <laughs> what do you think you should, as far as getting it out to the public, that's what the Phase of the Moon is about, getting the information. Were you willing to almost get yeah. it the so, so what would you do? You know, what would you do? Well, you'd probably uh, put him on tape and put it on YouTube, right? <laughs> and say, look, here's my alien friend. He's a real alien. And then what's going to happen? The government stooges are going to make up some phony videos and throw it right up there saying, yeah, and here's mine. And, oh, by the way, mine's a fake, and that's a fake, too. And then you're going to have other paid informants and dull deadheads who are going to just come and just swamp you with comments saying, well, that's a fake, and I know how you did it. And nobody's going to believe you anyway. <laughs> well, maybe possibly walking down uh, New York, in New York City with the alien and getting a mass uh, a mass sighting of an alien, create a panic. And it, how are they going to shut that down when you got thousands of people on their phones filming this entity of whatever? And maybe that could be the way. Right. But said then they will go and do the same thing, but with a fake alien, and then they'll expose that one as being a fake, and then they'll say, yours is a fake, and then it'll be in controversy. And with the controversy, nothing gets done, and it'll just go on and on. Now, I'm here to tell you the only way that uh, uh, contact is going to happen, the only way disclosure is going to happen is it's not up to us, it's up to them. When uh, the ETs finally decide it's time, and we're getting close because they have to wait until the vast majority of people are ready and willing 
to accept the idea that we're not alone in the universe and that there's other folks out there and that they are not necessarily uh, dangerous or hostile to us. And when that day comes, they will allow their craft to be seen over some major city or maybe more than one, and they'll hang there long enough for the news crews to get out and take good video of the whole thing, and then everybody's going to get, well, not everybody, there's still a lot of people who claim the world is actually flat. <laughs> but most everybody will go, okay, that's it, they're real and they're here. That's going to be the disclosure. People who are waiting around and working real hard, and I know a lot of these people uh, who are trying to get the government to fess up, come clean, and uh, and actually do their own disclosure, I think they're in for disappointment. I don't think that's going to happen. How long do you think disclosure is going to take place? I and mean, you wrote extensively about uh, the Phoenix Lights. And that practically yeah. was. Yeah, it's all, that's all part of the conditioning process. See, we are in a conditioning program right now. You go back to the national polls in the 1950s and you find that almost no one believed that there was any life outside the Earth. Well, today you find that the vast majority, 80, 90 percent, say, yeah, I think there could be life outside the earth. I either know it or I certainly believe it. Okay, so, you know, that's a total reversal of public uh, viewpoint from the 1950s till today. And so uh, they're still so working. What, like that's, a, it's, that's the conditioning process. How far away do you think? I mean, there's been a really strong movement towards disclosure, especially recently. So are you thinking maybe five years, ten years, or... Oh, uh, I think it might even be sooner than that. It, I think it depends on the uh, events here on Earth. Uh, if, if everything just keeps muddling along, then it might take another five to ten years, like you're saying. But uh, if things come to a head, if things get very disjointed, very uh, disorganized, and a lot of stuff's happening, they might decide to just step in. It could happen next week, next mm -hmm. year. And what will be the result, you think, of disclosure? How will our lives change? <laughs> well, that's another thing too. Don't hold your breath because let me tell you something. If they suddenly, if if President Obama came on national TV tomorrow and said, "Okay, we have a reason to believe that we're not alone in the universe, and that there's other beings out there, and they're uh, very advanced, and they come here and visit, but we have no reason to believe that they're hostile, and uh, everybody just remain calm, and who your government's looking into it," uh, I assure you, I don't think a whole lot would change. Uh, your bills would still keep coming. <laughs> Mr. Mars, if, techno if UFO disclosure was, uh, if it finally came to an end and the technology was there, wouldn't that affect everything? Like you said, things wouldn't change overnight. Uh, we would, our bills would still come. Yeah. Well, but see, that's now you're getting to the crux of uh, why that there will be no disclosure, certainly not from us anytime real soon, because if they do, see, the people who run this country, and I'm not talking about the president or the Congress, they don't run the country. They just mouth whatever their rulers tell them to say. I'm talking about the moneyed, vested moneyed interest that control this country. They don't really care if we know there's aliens out there. What they care about very, very strenuously is that if we know there's aliens out there, then we know for certain that there's alternative technology out there. And why would we keep paying ever-increasing prices for a dwindling supply of petroleum when we know there's free, limitless, non-polluting energy out there, right? Go ahead, Blake. Oh, there's an uh, interesting, it sounds like a UFO's landing in the background, but <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. That's, uh, uh, that's why I'm, uh, it sounds like that when I'm on the radio. <laughs> Well, you know, the videos we do receive from around the world, I think, are filming these advanced technology, uh, flying, call them what you will, saucers, drones, whatever they are, they're not practical or conventional in any way. And I think with all the cameras around the world filming them, that the truth is getting out in that way that there is something more advanced than what we're dealing with with the common technology, don't you think? Right. Exactly. And we're not just talking about propulsion technology. We're talking about energy as a whole. We're talking about medicine. We're talking about telecommunications. We're, you know, all of this would change because all this technology is out there. I'm in touch with people who are working on alternative technology today, and the biggest complaint is, is, that, is that they just hide this stuff, you know? 
Mr. Uh, Mars, what do you think about that if, if another country disclosed? I mean, obviously the U.S. government doesn't want to, but what do you think if a rogue country such as Venezuela was the first to say, hey, we're not alone? They, they've already done that. France had their uh, Comita report. Argentina has come out. Mexico, for God's sake has been hot at the UFOs and aired stuff for years. We, the mass media here he knows, ignores it, and there's nobody thinking in America anymore. They're all just dumbed down, you know, with the fluoride and the water and the, and the drugs and the everything else, and, uh, and all they do is watch TV, and the TV doesn't, would never talk about this. Well, I think still there hasn't yet, like a government, like ourselves, 1947 crash, aliens in our possession possibly, we're not the only country in the, in the world that has a crash sighting with alien bodies, and there's other governments that have recovered possible aliens. Why don't they? Right. They, they disclose, but they're not disclosing a real, real deal. I know a lot of these countries have disclosed, but why aren't they coming up with the bodies of the aliens? Right. Well, see, that's part of the phenomenon. You know, the, there's a lot of sightings, and I think there's even been crash deaths. I've seen some pretty convincing film out of. Uh, the old Soviet Union, that they recovered crashed objects. But uh, you've got to understand that the people that I was talking about, this moneyed, wealthy, vested interest elite that run this country, it's not just this country. They control the international banks, which control many of the other countries. Uh, with the fall of communism, the first thing that uh, they had to do was create a central bank. And uh, that was put together by these same international bankers, and uh, so now they exert a tremendous amount of control over what the Russian government does, as they do over Argentina and Mexico and all these other countries. So they get hold of this stuff, and they say, okay, you can talk about this, but we're taking this. And that's why it's uh, you, you don't have any of that to speak of. And then what little slips through, like the little uh, mummified alien or the little or the little piece of metal or whatever, then it's easy enough to just uh, uh, call that a hoax and go on. Mr. Martin. Good question for you. Uh, yeah, the famous movie They Live, and you, you, you refer to them as they, uh, the, the reference Illuminati has come up. Has, do they have a name now, these they guys? Can we refer <laughs> to? Well, you can call them, you know, it's got various names. <laughs> you can call them uh, the Bilderberg Group. You can call them the Illuminati. You, you, you can call them the shadow government. You, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a uh, this is a group of bloodline related people that track their uh, their uh, ancestry all the way back to the Anunnaki. Um, in fact, I think it's quite telling that the Rothschild banking dynasty, the Rothschilds, uh, have publicly stated that they are the descendants of Nimrod, the ancient Sumerian god king. Uh, they even named one of their children Nimrod. So, see, they're well aware of all the stuff that we're talking about. Uh, you know, you go try to talk to your friends and or relatives and or neighbors, and you start trying to talk about some of this stuff. They roll their eyes and act like you're some kind of a, a nutball. But uh, these folks in control, they know what we're talking about. In fact, after you read my book, Our Occulted History, where I track these people all the way from the Anunnaki uh, to the present time, uh, you know, it, it begs the, the question, a very serious question, is are they even us? All you have to do is look at what's happening in the world today and then look at what's happening in the United States. First, I think Okay. Wait, the United States is still a very rich country. We're rich in resources, okay? And we're rich in a reasonably educated workforce that really wants to work. Why in the world are we in such financial distress like we are right now? $16 trillion in debt, which we can never pay back. Never. Okay? Why is it that way? And again, I submit to you because these very folks we're talking about, whatever you want to call them, they want it that way. Yes, I actually heard that without debt, that our U.S. economy would collapse, that they need to keep creating debt. But I wanted to ask you a very important question. What is it that each listener right now to on Revolution Radio and all the viewers that will see this on Third Phase of the Moon, what can they do as individuals to help disclosure finally happen? Okay. Uh, well, f number one, turn off the TV and start thinking for yourself. 
uh, you know, scout the internet, find out what's going on. You guys are obviously ahead of the curve. Now, for the people listening, what can I do? I hear this all the time. Well, number one, I can't t- tell you A, B, C, D, do this, and this will happen. But it's all going to be on an individual basis based on where you are, what your education is, what your knowledge is, uh, what your uh, social uh, circles are, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's all going to have to be up to you as an individual. But here's a few ideas. Write letters to the editor of your local newspaper. Contact the editors of your local TV and radio station and demand that they do what they say they do, which is report the news, a- and ask them to investigate these things. Uh, hold a uh, hold a book club in your home. Invite your neighbors and your friends in and uh, get some of the books that you found quite helpful. And uh, let's say, let's read this book, and then we'll come back in a couple of weeks and we'll discuss it. You know, uh, get out, go to meetings, uh, get any place where there's a public gathering, raise questions. Don't, don't get argumentative and don't get sanctimonious. Don't get anybody upset. Just, uh, raise questions. You know, well, how about this? How to explain this? Did you know about this? Okay. And just get the word out there and get people to thinking for themselves. The documentary featured an extensive summary of the footage, the canisters containing the footage, an expert analysis from the likes of Stanton Friedman. One film expert noted in the documentary that the footage came in an old Soviet canister that had information labeled on it that was consistent with info written directly on the film reel. The numbers on the film's header matched the canisters they came. The header of the film had the crest of the KGB on it and the term for T.O.P. secret is shown in the first few seconds of this footage and image to the right. Having real-looking alien footage is one thing, but including the original film real canisters means you are extremely close to proving 100 authenticity. This is something that has traditionally lacked in other more popular alien videos such as the widely known alien autopsy or the alien interview videos. Three. Several KGB documents In the documentary, several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic along with credible testimony from a former Soviet KGB operative who claims to know about the event. At first everyone believed that those debris were part of some novelty aircraft manufactured in the United States or England, said Pavel Klimchenkov a former KGB operative, but having done some measurements material analysis. We came to the conclusion that none of the domestic or foreign manufacturers known to us could have produced this apparatus, at least not in the conditions existing on this planet. Along with Pavel's testimony, authentic KGB top-secret documents were obtained by the filmmakers. Allegedly costing them $10.000, the documents described in detail a crash site recovery operation of a disc-shaped object and organic remains. Based on the credible testimony, KGB documents, Expert film analysis and the general good feeling one gets when watching this interesting crash site video, it is safe to assume that this film indeed may be authentic. What about the autopsy? This footage will be posted in our second part article along with thoughts and analysis, actors, training exercises, skepticism. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. One skeptical viewpoint suggests that the object's thickness is far too small to support any would-be alien pilot. The craft's outer edge is seen on the image is only 12 to 36 inches. However, it is not necessarily indicative of the overall thickness of the craft. The image was taken from the only part in the video sequence where the craft's edge is visible, 
and since the camera never goes behind, there is no way to tell how much depth the craft may have on the other side. Additionally, if you consider the side facing us may be actually be the bottom, we can easily see that this craft can easily fit the traditional flying saucer shape as demonstrated by the below images. In this documentary they claim that, since they only were able to acquire four canisters of film, more film footage of this incident is available. Such as the entire digging, cleanup, and inside the craft investigation. To this date, almost a decade after it went public, no other videos have surfaced. A UFO crash site allegedly filmed by the Russian KGB in March of 1969 in the Sverdlovsk region of Russia. The footage was later obtained by documentary filmmakers who then published the movie, The Secret KGB UFO Files A film expert noted in the documentary that the film came in an old Soviet film can and the numbers on the film's header matched the cans they came in. The header of the film has the crest of the KGB on it and the term for T.O.P. secret. An autopsy of the alleged pilot of the UFO is seen in the documentary film. Soviet doctors examined the burnt torso of the entity and it is revealed that the three doctors died one week later all from cerebral hemorrhages. Death certificates are presented as proof. Several KGB documents are produced to prove the film is authentic. Some have put forth the argument that an American production crew filmed the footage in March 1998. These claims are put forth on websites claiming to know the truth about this footage. To date they have failed to show even one current photo of any of the soldiers in the film nor any statements from the actors that they were indeed only actors in this film. This should be easy to obtain if the footage was recently filmed. Another theory suggests the film was a training exercise. Yet no one has produced witnesses verifying this claim. UFO aliens may have helped build pyramids of Giza says. Cairo University Archaeologist Head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen in December 2010 had told an audience that there might be truth to the theory that aliens helped the ancient Egyptians build the oldest of pyramids, the Pyramids of Giza. On being further questioned by Mr. Marek Novak, a delegate from Poland as to whether the pyramid might still contain alien technology or even the UFO with its structure, Dr. Shaheen was vague and replied I cannot confirm or deny this, but there is something inside the pyramid that is not of this world. Delegates to the conference on ancient Egyptian architecture were left shocked, however Dr. Shaheen had refused to comment further or elaborate on his UFO and alien related statements. Down below is 90s The Secret KGB UFO Files documentary, that deals with the fact that Russian had already discovered the tomb of alien humanoid in Egypt and something is beneath the pyramid. The secret KGB UFO files documentary interestingly supporting the head of the Cairo University Archaeology Department, Dr. Ela Shaheen claim as well. Actually ancient Egyptian writings very often talk of beings from the sky, the sky opening and bright lights coming down to teach them technology and give them wisdom. Many pictures and symbols resemble UFOs and aliens. Possibly aliens built the Great Pyramid. And these solid long-lasting construction techniques were adopted by the Egyptians. Ancient Egyptian legends tell of Teb Zepi, or the first time. This is described as an age when sky gods came down to earth and raised the land from mud and water. They supposedly flew through the air in flying boats and brought laws and wisdom to man through a royal line of pharaohs. And of course, this was all thrown out the window when Christianity came along. Keep in mind that the gods were the one and only religion that there was. No other conflicting beliefs? Why? Well because it was fact, not faith. The modern church would have you believe that it's just a myth. But you have to ask yourself on the edge of Oakham Razor, what truly indeed is more likely? There has always been the question. How did the Egyptians feed and care for the 100,000 s slaves that it would have taken to build the ancient structures like that of the pyramids in Egypt? One minute it is a very backwards country and almost overnight a highly advanced and technological culture sprung into existence. We now have the answer to that very question and evidence that the Egyptians had help extraterrestrial help at that. Thanks to Russia, the KGB and a top secret project called Project Isis. Astrophysicist, neurologist and science advisor and advanced propulsion system gained access to the files of Project Isis. 
This was a top-secret project brought about by KBG concerning the discovery of the Tomb of the Visitor in 1961. Up until Sci-Fi purchased this exclusive footage from an agent of the Russian Mafia, it had never been seen outside the top-secret facilities of the KGB. Sci-Fi showed it one time on television and as it stands today, no evidence of this film or the project is available. Except what we have copies of here given to us by a client that had taped the original show. This video is a, a, a powerful documentary with actual footage filmed by the KGB and verified by specialists in the field. Authentic film footage. If we can somehow bring attention back on Project ISIS and prove it out, it will change the history of the beginning of the civilization of man. During the Cold War. Nikita Khrushchev was determined to show the world that communism was superior over the democracy. As he realized that it would be too costly to compete with the U.S. in the space race, Khrushchev chose to go the other route. Having over 300,000 agents in the secret police and espionage organizations he focused most of this resource on alternative science, such as paranormal phenomena, psychometric weapons, biogenerators and mind-altering machines. 1920s. During the Stalinist regime, a dark room was created where the KGB conducted psychotronic weapons research on prisoners sentenced to die in political dissidents. After 1936 these files were transferred to the secret archives of the KGB, continuing on with their paranormal research. Khrushchev achieved great success with his biogenerators and machines to alter human minds, which worried, naturally, the United States knowing that the Soviet Union was there to conquer and overthrow. Russia, being that its borders surrounded the largest landmass of the world, had the largest amount of UFO sightings. If they could capture one of these flying objects and reverse engineer it they could have the greatest advanced aeronautical designs. They got lucky in January 1986 when a spacecraft crashed in Dalgorsk but remained intact. The craft was back engineered and the process was quite successful. But to achieve the most superior advancement in global domination, they went in search for something that was only a rumor or legend. The Chamber of Knowledge in Egypt If the legends were true, storehouse of knowledge left behind by ancient visitors from outer space was concealed in the Great Pyramid. A team of archaeologists were composed of Egyptologists from the Russian Soviet Academy of Science, was sent to Egypt. The fearing that the CIA would learn of this expedition, the Kremlin operated with complete secrecy. By the late 1950s Egypt accounted for 43% of all the Soviet aid for third world nations. When they started the ISIS project the Soviet military personnel in Egypt was estimated over 20,000. The heavy military presence was used to disguise the efforts of the mission scientists headquartered in Cairo. They would operate under the guise of Arab peasants or Russian officers. To speed things up, in 1959 the KGB recruited professional informationalists to wiretap Egyptian officials. This paid of in July 24, 1960 when a conversation was recorded that would then change myth into reality. The official had been given a call that two Bedouin had stumbled upon the tomb of the visitor. The Bedouin were in the hospital and kept repeating, the visitor God. At this moment in time. Project ISIS became top priority and all efforts were made to immediately follow up by having the Bedouin show them where they had found this tomb. SEIFI was able to purchase several documents and film footage as to the KGB documentations of their findings. Taken out of Egypt and brought to the secret facility of the KGB was this. Memo to high-ranking KGB official. My agents had secured the notes of one of the scientists working on the tomb of the visitor findings. Another was the inventory of contents taken from the tomb as follows. Location of finding. Undisclosed, 15 crates of relics, one partially mummified body, one stone sarcophagus, eight hieroglyphic samples. Old report from a project scientist that was one of the first to enter the tomb. During the inspection of the wall segment we noted that a strange magnet repulsive force seemed to be emanating from the rock. We were unable to find any scientific explanation cryptologist report. Partial decoded message on tomb wall indicating a prophecy of the return of the winged gods. The Kremlin took the cryptologist report very seriously. KGB was ordered to determine target locations e-planets, stars, galaxies. 
they had to duplicate the stars as they would have been over Giza thousands of years ago. They finally found it, in the stars and constellation of Orion during the year 10,500 BC. Although it was possible that the builders could have been working off plans of a time before the pyramids was constructed this was proven not to be the case. Metal and synthetic materials of tomb were determined to be of unknown origin and the tomb was carbon dated giving it a dating of 10,500 BC meaning the pyramid had to have been made at 10,500 BC. Kins of film were purchased by SEIFI through the Russian Mafia agent which originally came from the maximum security archives of the KGB. These kins contain film of KGB filming the process of the tomb and sarcophagus being opened. Sci-Fi had this film analyzed before purchasing by experts in this field. Finding no evidence of fraud, SEIFI purchased kins of film. The documentary is in black and white showing soldiers entering the tomb without gas masks. As they opened the sarcophagus, you can see toxic fumes escaping and the reaction of the soldiers as they were being affected. It also shows the mummy contained inside. The film shows the soldiers leaving the tomb fast and then a chemical warfare specialist team comes in with protective clothing. There is talk from one that was there in the tomb, that the energy inside, during the first days of exploration was very very high. They also had a team of psychics go in and do some special readings of the tomb. It later goes on to show the KGB and Bedouin loading trucks with crates to be shipped back to Russia. According to KGB documents, researchers began to wonder if the pyramid was designed for one particular purpose. They thought it was possibly a machine, being that it was designed like a three-dimensional triangular depiction of a hemisphere. Their thoughts were there must have been a reason why it was designed for resonating with the planet. Their thoughts went to a prism and that the pyramids have powers to alter the cosmic rays, that the pyramids are huge prisms capable of concentrating energy, capturing light from the stars which would initiate a process which would turn the pyramid into an interstellar transmitter. The three pyramids and SPHNIX could be integral parts of an immense machine designed by alien engineers linked by a master control mechanism inside the Great Pyramids. They noted that the passageway goes to main chamber. And above the sarcophagus was a tunnel of star shaft. They reasoned that when a specific star alignment occurs a streak of energy goes down the shaft. Scientists speculated that the radiant energy hitting the sarcophagus could initiate something similar to a cold fusion reaction. The prism structure of the pyramid would then magnify and transfer to the corresponding pyramids. A united beam of energy could erupt creating a cosmic beacon used by alien starship for future navigating. According to ancient legends all around the world, they all have the same thing in common. The visitors were like men but more like gods. They were giants. They traveled among the stars. They brought us the knowledge. Legends of the first emperors of China were called the Sons of Heaven and made the first pyramids of China. Mexico and Yucatan have similar legends. Star walkers can be found throughout Egyptian texts and s. American folklore. The visitors are described as the giants man slash gods giants or titans. And it seems. All cultures may be traced to a single parent civilization could it be E.T.? Later on in the documentary, it shows them working on the mummy attempting to give it a face and identity. A computer projection of the mummy was made as it laid in the sarcophagus. Experts that were there to observe the fluorescent reconstruction of the face described to sci-fi that if they had not been there themselves, they would not have believed what the face revealed after reconstruction. When skull and face was completed, it showed a humanoid type large cranium large eyes, small chin. Small teeth but not earth humanoid but some being that had to have been extraterrestrial. Later, using underground radar technology, the KBG found a passageway under the tomb of the visitor directly below was a large chamber. They believed they found the chamber of knowledge, but was afraid to open the tomb, thinking it could be a Trojan horse capable of blowing up the entire planet. They decided to seal the tomb, wipe away the location of the tomb and close the project. It seemed however that all were affected by the discovery. Some had personality changes. Some disappeared entirely others committed suicide and others no longer could support their old religious beliefs.
The first official report of sightings, that we are aware of, was by King Tutkamaniai about 3400 years ago. Sightings continued through the ages. Sightings seemed to pick up with man mastered the skies. But when we conquered the inner workings of the atom, the aliens of Orion stepped up their observation with an explosion of UFO sightings that continue up to the present. UFO abduction reports began to sweep around the world in the early 60s. A pattern was developing with nearly all abductees reporting physical examinations, insertion of objects and artificial inseminations. Many women abductees believed they were being impregnated to give birth to alien hybrids. In the last decade reports such as these have risen dramatically. It may be highly likely that the genetic colonization program that started back in the ancient times has resumed. The question was asked could they be cloning themselves by implanting their alien genes into human na? Are humans being transformed into an alien species through genetic engineer? The ancient Egyptians have always said that our DNA came from the heavens and that someday they would return. Did the KGB discover the truth in the chamber of knowledge about the true agenda of the Yet? And what was discovered on the wall of the tomb of the visitor prophesized that they would return. But when? Secrets cannot be contained. Not even KGB secrets. A group of scientists, computer programs, doctors, etc. shortly after the discovery of the tomb of the visitor, came together to discuss the possibilities of this discovery. They fully believed that the visitor was none other than Osiris, the alien king. Thus they gave themselves the name, the followers, based off the followers of Horus in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. According to Egyptian beliefs a family of gods came from the stars to Egypt. They were the ones that gave the people of Egypt the knowledge and wisdom. Later they left earth back to their star homes, except for Osiris. He stayed and taught the followers. It was their duty to protect and keep the ancient knowledge he gave them until his return. The Egyptians were astronomers and fully understood that the stars were the map to the great god Osiris and the afterlife. Modern followers would secretly come together in their homes to discuss the possibility of the return of Osiris. They believed that the second coming of Osiris would herald a new age for mankind. They believed that when the tomb was discovered and the seal was broken, a signal was transmitted to the visitors. They calculated and estimated the time it would take for the electromagnetic signal to reach the constellation of Orion. They figured that they could return no earlier than April 23, 1985. With that time frame in mind, the group left Russia and took off to Egypt. Never to return. The only remains left behind of their meeting with the visitors was a newspaper clippage found in the KGB archives of a group of tourists disappearing in the middle of the night in Egypt, 1985. And one home movie project with film. This film showed the group in front of the pyramid at night. It shows a light appearing in the sky, the group dropping to their knees in prayer the light becoming brighter and then nothingness. A daughter of parents that were part of this group was shown the home video by the SEIFI team, of which she recognized her parents and burst into tears. Did anyone happen to see a documentary on sci-fi called Secret KGB UFO Files? I happened to catch this yesterday and why I'm leaning to the side of skepticism. I have to admit that it was intriguing. Basically the story goes. In the early 60s the KGB discovered a tomb at the Giza Plateau containing an ever. Luckily there was film footage ha ha. The grainy film contained footage of archaeologists dressed in KGB gear opening the tomb of what was thought to be an ancient Egyptian king. When they do, toxic smoke overcomes one of them and the other two run out. It is later learned that the body isn't human. The footage looked as if it had been produced to look old. Also, included were shots of psychics levitating in the tomb. One thing that caught my attention is the archaeologist that was supposed to have been claimed by the toxic smoke was later helping move creates of evidence down some stairs. Despite the curious film footage, the documentary was very interesting and had me glued from the jump. For decades, American agencies have stockpiled information on UFOs.
So did their counterparts behind the Iron Curtain, soldiers, scientists and spies all paint a disturbing picture of the KGB's secret campaign. Is this the stunning proof that the Soviets recovered something not from this earth? When U.S. researchers began looking into just how much the Soviet government knew about UFOs and extraterrestrial visitation, they were not surprised to learn that the Russians took the subject very seriously. What they didn't expect was evidence of ancient alien visitation, paranormal properties associated with related artifacts and most shocking of all, of a mass abduction in 1985, among the piles of materials obtained from former Soviet spies. Some extremely puzzling and disturbing documents and film footage surfaced confirming rumors, which had been circulating for decades, in the late 1950s and 60s. The Russians became very interested in a number of unusual and newly discovered archaeological sites in Egypt by interpreting ancient symbols. One of those sites was believed to contain the remains of a life form not from Earth. Startling top-secret film footage, never before seen outside the Kremlin confirms the Soviet mission to recover and analyze these remains. Join host Roger Moore in an exclusive investigation into one of the most compelling events of our time.